everybody. I'm so sorry. Please come in. We've packed out this hall, but there are some spaces still. If you don't mind sitting on the floor, we can fit everybody in. So, good evening. I'm Melissa Leach, and I'm director here at IDS, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome all of you and our online audience to this very special event in the IDS calendar, our annual lecture. And I'm particularly excited to welcome our special guest and lecturer for this evening, Dr. Isa Touture, who is Vice President of the Doctor. And also many other things, which I will tell you a little bit about in a moment before we start the lecture. And I'll tell you a bit about why we felt she was absolutely the person to speak to us at this point in our current era. Before I do that, just to note a couple of practical things. Um, as I said, we will be recording and live streaming this event um, via the IDS website and IDS Facebook. And when we get to questions, we will be taking questions both from all of you and also from our, our online audience. So be aware of that. Um, social media, everybody watching the lecture is very much encouraged to tweet about it and to do so using the IDS annual lecture hashtag. Um, if you have a hearing loop or hearing aid, we have a hearing loop <coughs> in this room and you just need to turn it to position T if you want support with hearing. Um, and the other practical thing is if the fire alarm goes off during the next hour and a half, it will be for real. We're not expecting a, a practice. <laughs> so we'll need to follow drill and get out. So those are the practical issues. So then let's turn to, to the important matters in hand. So we're in a world today which is experiencing struggles around both democracy and around justice and particularly around women's rights and gender justice. And we have here a speaker who is more qualified, I think, than anybody I can imagine to speak to those issues. Dr. Issa Touré, Issa Touré is a highly experienced activist on gender and women's rights, and particularly on FGM. She is also an academic. She completed her PhD in development studies at IDS in 2004, and she's also a politician. She became the first female presidential <laughs> candidate for the Gambia in 2016. Um, in that year, she was also appointed the Minister for, for Trade and Regional Integration, and also carried the portfolio on labor. That was a very large portfolio at the time. Um, and then she became the Minister for Health and Social Welfare in 2018 in President Barrow's government. And then earlier this year, she became Vice President of the Gambia. Um, she did her PhD here at IDS. She's probably the most renowned and high profile of our alumni at the moment, <laughs> and we're incredibly proud of what she's achieved. She's an inspiration, I think, to us all. Um, but I also, she's particularly special to me because I had the privilege to be her PhD supervisor back in the early 2000s. <laughs> what a really wonderful piece of work on gender and land rights and property, which was a fantastic PhD. And I said to when she completed her PhD very successfully in 2004, said to me, right, I'm now going to go back to my country, I'm going to go into politics, I'm going to inspire women leaders, and I'm going to change the system and change the government. And I said, okay, I said to you, you'd go. <laughs> a few minutes later, there is no doubt that she has delivered. And what we're going to hear today... <laughs> and what we're going to hear this evening is her story and, and the story of how, how that happened and how she brought about a kind of transformational change that I think most of us can, can only, only dream of. I think the things about this story are that it mixes the personal with the political in the best feminist way. Um, and although it's a story about the Gambia, very much, it has enormously wide implications for how we think about and act on gender justice, how we think about and act on democracy at a time when democracies around the world are under threat. The story you'll hear this evening is actually about the reversal of that movement from a situation of authoritarian populism and dictatorship of the most devastating kind to a very bright democratic future. And in a way, it's a story which is fundamentally about the politics of hope 
something we're talking about a lot in IDS as we seek to move forward into our own new strategy next year. So um, without further ado, let me hand over to Her Excellency, Vice President, Isotu Touré, and welcome to you. Good evening to everybody, and uh, good evening to my mentor, my supervisor, uh, Professor Melissa Leach, and to all and all other protocols respectfully observed. Your mm -hmm. Excellency, the High Commissioner of the Gambia, uh, the technical advisor with me, and all other protocols duly and respectfully observed. I am very grateful to be here to come and inspire you. Uh, my topic today is about from dictatorship to democracy, the role of women. And what I need, what I want to do here, there is a, letter, a paper that I have written already, but I want to look at the general context where the First Republic was about peace, stability, and hope. The Second Republic was about abuse, violence, and despair. And the Third Republic, where we are entering into a new era that brings in hope, peace, and purpose. This is how I am at, uh, addressing this. And then this next step is looking at a dictatorship in the making, how dictators are made, and what are some of the issues that emerge that should give you a warning sign of how the system is deteriorating. And thirdly, the emergence, my emergence as a presidential candidate up to the convention that decided on the leadership of His Excellency, President Adam Abaro, whom I am ably and happily serving under. And then we look at uh, a dawn of a new era, a feminist perspective, because you find that power and politics is mainly a male preserve. And sometimes it's so jealously guarded that uh, any other intrusion is considered a disruption of the status quo. And I want to share some experiences on those feminist experiences, um, perspectives, and to show how we were able to disrupt the status quo and ensure that change was done for the good of everybody and not for individual interests. This is what my paper is all about. And I'll be ready to take questions as I need for, uh, uh, when I complete so that we learn from each other and share the experiences. Uh, by 1994, the government of the Gambia, which was led by Sir Dauda Khairabal Jawara, had been a power for almost had been in power for almost three decades. During that period, the country had established itself as a viable nation. The government had earned all its for itself credentials of democracy, rule of law, and good governance. At a time when many other African countries, particularly in West Africa, were beset with coups and counter coups. This was a rare exception. Perhaps this accounted, among other factors, for the choice of the Gambia to host the headquarters of the African Center for Human and People's Rights. Jawara nurtured the spirit of peace, respect for rule of law and freedom of expression. The country saw progress in strong institutions with well-trained scholars from the Commonwealth Scholarships and allied institutions under the Commonwealth and beyond. During the era, the Gambia was credited for its robust and professional civil service system, resulting in visiting scholars and placement of interns from different parts of the world. The country also attracted quite a number of pilot projects from the World Bank and other related institutions to advance national development projects and programs. <coughs> Similarly, the peace and stability enjoyed during the First Republic and the respect for the fundamental freedom of the people earned the founder as the champion of peace. <coughs> stability, uh, uh, as a result, the Gambia is dubbed the smiling coast of Africa for the peace, stability, and hospitality of its people. While the Gambia consolidates its achievements under the First Republic, it became quite evident that, con that the Constitution, which is the supreme law governing the country, did not take account of term limits, resulting in the tendency to overstay in power. This is a trend observed across the continent and thus became an issue for political activists and the debate and, uh, uh, on democracy, politics, and good governance. The party's long rule made them take, that, take for granted that all was well. Resting on their laurels, the party started losing grip of power. 
As political dynamics were unfolding within the ruling party, the emergence of the various factions and the internal rivalry over who will succeed Sardawda Kaira Bajawara resulted in the weakening and fragmentation of the ruling party. With no established army in the Gambia until 1981, the coup attempt in 1981 of Kukoi Samba and some elements of the then paramilitary field force was contained with the assistance of Senegal under a bilateral defense agreement. The country was then spared the fate of many West African countries. But this was not to be for long. Jawara had overstayed in power and the party was weakened by factional rivalry. This situation impacted on the country's development progress, creating a lacuna in effective governance and political wrangling among party members who would normally have been united in purpose and direction as the ruling party. I started my public engagement and career after my undergraduate studies as, an, as a monitoring and evaluation officer under the World Bank Women in Development Project on Field Research in 1991 in the Women's Bureau, which was established by an act of parliament in 1980. Under the office of the president, and was attracted by the work that was being done there in the area of advocacy for the advancements of women in all areas of national development. I threw my weight behind a formidable team of women like Safia Tusinati, Kumba Marena, Minta Jame Sidibe, and Kadimani, who have been working in Atta to advance the cause of women. I took interest in the traditional practices in society and how this served the patriarchal control on women and their harmful effects on women and society in general. That issue attracted the attention of the African continent, AU, and led to the establishment of the Inter-African Committee on Traditional Practices, known as the IAC. The Gambia chapter was established under the National Women's Bureau, under the office of the president. Given the sensitive nature of the practices and the high level of resistance, it was deemed fit to separate it from the Women's Bureau and place it as an NGO to give it the public attention it required. I was appointed as the first coordinator responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the program, working with members under the leadership and guidance of Mrs. Safia Pusinati. After a short time with the Women's Bureau, I joined the Management Development Institute to serve as a senior management trainer and decided to set up a gender <coughs> and management unit in sight of answers to promote women's rights and gender equality. One of the modules taught in the gender unit was focused on harmful traditional practices for the certificate and diploma program. The cracks that affected the ruling party marked the beginning of the end of the era of the First Republic in an unconstitutional way. The young officers in the army established in 1981 were growing restless. The coup could have been averted as the revelation in the ongoing truth reconciliation and reparations commission have shown. The Gambia entered perhaps the darkest chapter of its post-independent era in 1994. Yaya Diame, who emerged as the head of the Provisional Armed Forces Ruling Council, which metamorphosed into the APRC party, who was only 29 years old, and a bitter and frustrated army captain who modeled himself after the Libyan leader, Muammar Gaddafi. The change, which was justified under the guise of ending the long-term rule of Dawara, seemed to have attracted the support of some intellectuals who offered their services to advise and guide the young soldier. This brought the Gambia under military rule for the first time since 1965. The early period of the unconstitutional government was filled with tribal <coughs> and ethnic sentiments, and the attempts to ostracize and marginalize Mandinkas. The first casualty of the junta was the constitution and the political establishments. The constitution was suspended and the junta ruled by decrees, drafted and pr promulgated through the help of some willing members of the political elite, who either believed that the military junta had only come to remove the sit-tight president <coughs> and would soon hand over power back to a legitimate government, or simply leverage on the opportunity to create a niche for themselves in the new military dispensation. Time was to prove how wrong they were in their assumptions. 
Many of these latter fell victims to the victim to the very system they helped to create and prop up. All existing political parties but one were banned from 1994 to 1996. Then we had the emergence of a dictator in the banking. With the coming in the force of what is purportedly referred to as democratic government, government under the metamorphosed junta, the Gambia saw itself through a trajectory of events, leading to the loss of all the achievements and progress made in the First Republic. Rather than building on the gains and best practices of the Jawara government, Yaya Jame started a dismantling process of the democratic institutions of rule of law and good governance that the country had hitherto enjoyed. Instead of consolidating on the democratization process which began in the First Republic, he changed the architecture of democracy to autocracy, resulting in gradually nurturing a dictatorial regime for 22 years. I had returned to the Gambia in December 1993 upon completion of my master's degree at the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, barely six months before the coup in July 1994. I returned to my work at the Management Development Institute, MDI, as a principal management trainer where I had already started the first ever gender unit in the Gambia, offering courses on gender and development. It became one of the most popular courses in the Institute for Students of Both Sexes. Much as I loved what we were doing in the diploma program of the Gender Unit in Management Development Institute, I had to leave the Institute to the chagrin of both students and myself. In 2005, an executive directive from the office of the president required all civil servants to get approval from the state house before making any public statement. I took a voluntary retirement from the civil service to give full time to the work we were already doing in Gampo Trap. The same year, Ami Bojang Sisoho, a radio producer in the state-run Radio Gambia, also resigned her job and joined me full time in Gampo Trap. Thus was born the twosome Aisatu and Ami. Together, we started the same fate of our arrest, detention, and protracted trial on Bogos Charles. At the broad political level, all the main existing political parties except one were banned. A new constitution was tailor made to suit the military leadership while placing heavy restrictions on political opponents and civil liberties. The 1997 constitution was thus adopted in a referendum while all political parties remained effectively banned and all civil liberties, liberties curtailed. Democracy in the Gambia henceforth took the slippery path to dictatorship. With the political parties muzzled, the judiciary compromised through the hiring of foreign judges, the security agents immunized from prosecution for all acts of assault on the citizen. The power and authority of the state was usurped by the president who thus sealed his status as a dictator. In 1997, the 1997 constitution was to be amended 52 times. Each amendment was an erosion of civil liberties, a constraint on political opponents, and a tightening of his grip on power. Civil society organizations remain perhaps one avenue for citizens to champion the concerns of Gambia. International support was therefore largely directed to CSOs. One era of major concern among key players of CSUs, apart from the uh, restoration of rule of law and good governance, was the attempt to shape government policies towards women and the girl tribe. Our efforts in that direction were strengthened at the global level by the Beijing Conference of 1995. As the consultant for CSUs, we <coughs> guided the country report towards the Beijing Conference with the expected outcome of bringing visibility to the concerns of women and a roadmap for intervention directed at women and children in response to the 12 critical areas of concern. Other issues of strategic importance to women, like maternal mortality, forced and early marriage, and harmful traditional practices like female genital mutilation, which are directly affecting the well-being of women and the girl child and the society were ignored. A combination of poverty, early marriage, and patriarchal factors caused a low level of enrollment and retention of girls in schools. To address that, we at Gampo Track have started a scholarship program for girls from disadvantaged backgrounds through a sponsorship program from our development partners. Post-Biden government, 
Post Biden, government was convinced of a need for intervention and a program of free education for all girls at primary school level and a partial support at secondary level was set up. The next level of parliamentary election in 2002 saw the election of three female MPs, all from the ruling party, of whom Duta Kamaso was expelled, a lady, before end of her term. By the 1997 constitution, an MP expelled from his or her party loses the seat, as in the case of Duta Kamaso. The draft constitution being discussed presently addresses issues like this, such that an elected MP does not lose his or her seat when expelled from the party. There were nominated MPs of which Belinda Bidwell was made speaker, the first female to hold that position. In the case of FGM, government position was very hostile. It openly took a position to promote the practice, threatening anti-FGM advocates with arrest. The acquiescence of our former colleagues in the Women's Bureau, who are now in cabinet, was perceived as a betrayal of a noble cause we had all set out to pursue. We remain undaunted and pursued our goals with renewed vigor. Government strategy was to use religious justification to uphold what was essentially the deep-rooted traditional practices. Wahhabi Islamic scholars were enlisted to propagate FDM as a compulsory prescription for Muslims and point all opponents of the practice as non-Muslims. The danger we faced was palpable. Leaders of all political parties, after the lifting of the ban on them in 2001, distanced themselves from FGM issues. The popular sentiment and belief at the time was that it was an Islamic injunction. Any stand against is what not going to win any votes for politicians. Behind, this, behind the scene, however, most prominent political leaders were sympathetic to our cause, but we would have to be the ones to state our case publicly. Amidst the deafening silence of political leaders, we raised our voices loudly and powerfully that FDM is harmful and should be banned. It was, however, very clear to us then that we would have to devise a knowledge-based strategy that would reach all communities highlighting the false assumptions of the religious base of the practice and serious health consequences. The base of the practice and serious health consequences uh, the exposure and training at our disposal to wit at the Center for Africa and Family Studies in, Niger in Nairobi, Kenya, on family planning and sexual and reproductive health issues, ILO Center, Turin, on development of a multimedia modular package on the elimination of female genital mutilation on the African continent, a master's thesis reconceptualizing traditional practices in the Gambia, the case of female genital mutilation, which was my MA thesis, my training here in IDS, and the numerous interactions and exchanges with colleagues in the Inter-Africa Committee, IAC, women living under Muslim laws, gender equality in the, middle, uh, in the Muslim world, Musawa, had adequately prepared us for this. More than anything else, our strong conviction and belief in the course we have set for ourselves gave us strength and courage to continue. Using the cluster approach in our work with communities on FGM, we crisscross the entire length and breadth of the country, reaching out to the remotest communities with our message on the harmful traditional practice of FDM, early marriage, and the effective participation of women in leadership and decision-making positions helped us a lot. Four regions have already abandoned female genital mutilation, marked by elaborate celebrations of dropping of the knife ceremony. We were celebrating the fifth DOK, in Nyamina Jari on the 18th of November 2015, when government, realizing that many communities were already stopping the practice, announced the ban on FDA. And what did he say? He said, can I speak to Dr. Ture? I was in the groups of the leaders, and I received the call, and he said, are you happy now that I have banned the, uh, uh, the practice? And I said, it's not for me, it's for the children, because mine is a born case, but it's the future generation that we are protecting. Of course, knowing that this was the... Uh, for politics. <laughs> now, from there was the emergence of a presidential candidate to the convention. The coalition made a convention. As the democratic space shrunk, shrunk under the dictatorship of Yahya Jami, we witnessed the excesses of the regime's human rights violations, transgressions, perpetration of injustice on citizens, 
and curtailment of access to justice. We realized that NGOs and CSOs working directly with communities were being followed by the security operatives of the dictator. Gampo Trap then was under the close surveillance constantly because of our outreach activities at the grassroots level with state intelligence agents attached to inform on our activities. The organization is well known for its advocacy using rights-based approach. In 2013, a project was designed to address the gender gaps on the effective participation of women in leadership and decision-making positions. The project covered all regions of the country, targeting youth, women, political parties, and other groups. The objective was to create awareness about the need for effective participation of women in politics and government, to raise awareness about women's rights, and to lobby political parties to support women in their political parties at all levels of elective office. Similarly, the consciousness of youth and other target was raised to support women as leaders in their aspects of development. The project was basically addressing perceptions, myths, and beliefs about women's leadership. It was during this engagement with the grassroots across the country that women expressed their frustrations regarding educated women, who are doing a lot for them as rural women in sensitizing and raising their consciousness to demand for their rights in all aspects of development in the Gambia. During our sensitization in the Upper River region, a Sarahule woman emerged and raised her hands to be, to be allowed to speak. She was allowed and she said, Dr. Isaku, you and Ami Bojan Sisoho have sensitized us on many issues such as female genital mutilation, early marriage, economic empowerment of women, children's rights. Now you have come up with women's representation in decision-making positions. You, the educated women, should take a lead and see if we will not support you. Men will not give us all our rights. But if more educated women are in the parliament and leadership position, we will realize our rights. She went further. All our youths are gone. Today, you are going to speak to mama youth and papa youth. That's in code. Because all the able-bodied young people have gone through the back way because there was no hope for them and they have to leave. Today, our farms and plots are empty because we have lost our youth and the elderly cannot work on them. We, the women, are left behind with elderly men and we have to carry the body. We are aware of our limitations. We want you to come out because the country is suffering and all of us are affected. Rather than telling us, you, the educated ones, should take the lead and free the country from the difficult situation we are currently faced with. This is echoed by women and you as we move from one community to the other, loud and clear, calling for change. While this was the reality on the ground, some people were not very optimistic about the readiness of the opposition parties to come together as a united front against the incumbents. Many people were disenchanted by the outcome of the earlier coalition efforts by the various political parties. On more than two occasions, attempts in forming a broad-based coalition failed largely over the issue of leadership. This resulted in abandoning the campaign or parting ways in the midst of their campaign as a coalition, resulting in the election of the APRC and entrenching the dictator. This political situation went on for more than 22 years, and all the various efforts made to unseat the incumbent failed despite the efforts. The dictator took advantage of the lack of unity of purpose and direction and shifted the balance of power. Hitherto, the political landscape was ex exclusively dominated by men, even though women played a critical role in putting them in power. Women constitute 58% of national voters, yet the number of women in governance and leadership positions at different levels are very, very low. Similarly, youth constitute about 65% of the population, yet they remain largely unemployed at 39% resulting in disillusionment and illegal migration. The call for change was loud and clear, pointing to activists to act. The concern among us was how to effect change in a non-violent way, given our human rights credentials. To quote Gina Kerry, we looked that challenge, we looked at that challenge, dead in the eye and gave it a wink. And then 
for the dawn of a new era, a feminist perspective. We set out to formalize a well thought out strategy based on the experience of the past. We felt that women, young people, and the social movement should engage in shaping the new political direction, working closely with the existing parties to galvanize our collective efforts to effect the change we desire in a non-violent way. As feminists, we reflected carefully on our strategies and through our efforts. We started the preparation using a very participatory, transparent and inclusive approach to set the tone that women were ready to engage with the process. Our engagement gave hope to a lot of groups and institutions, and many associated themselves both in the country and in the diaspora. A conversation started within us from diverse backgrounds such as Ami Bojang Sisaho in the Gambia, and Dei Jobate and Nene Bojang Ture in Norway. Together, we formed a formidable team, ISETU, to engage in disrupting the hitherto male-dominated political landscape. Ami Bojang Sisaho became the campaign manager. Others in the diaspora included youth activists like Omar Diba and Dr. Ture, my son, among others, who took up responsibility to create and manage a well-designed website. And here, I want to share a little bit of story from Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman elected into Congress and the first African-American to run for president who was known to have said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. <laughs> we did not bring a folding chair, we threatened to turn the table. <laughs> the Gambia finally became a, coalition, a, a totalitarian state with the army and the intelligence agencies performing the function of the police in civilian matters. Military and police checkpoints were encountered everywhere in the cities, on the highways and in the rural areas. A plethora of informers in offices and public spaces drove fear into citizens on account of which self-censorship was common. Political opponents, journalists and human rights activists were particularly targeted. Extrajudicial killings, detention without trial, and disappearances without trace were common occurrences. The details of some of these atrocities are only now being revealed in the ongoing Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission, which is called the TRRC. In his delusional state of, this this delusional state of mind, the president claimed supernatural powers of healing the sick, curing HIV, AIDS, asthma, hypertension, and infertility. He engaged in medical style, medieval style witch hunt, forcing targeted individuals to drink poisonous concoctions. It was quite apparent that we were saddened with not only a dictator, but a maniac as well. <laughs> Tribal politics was introduced in the country, pitting one tribe against the other, and he propped the rebel movement in the neighboring Kasamas province of Senegal. The Gambia under Yaya Gyame left the Commonwealth and pulled out of the International Criminal Court. He lost the support of the majority of the voters, but he so terrorized Gambians that only a few dared challenge him. Those who did face his wrath and were killed, those who challenged him were terrorized, that only a few dared challenge him. Those who did face the wrath and were killed, like his former finance minister, Korosise, or were jailed in the notorious Maitu prison, which he gleefully called his five-star hotel, as were myself and Amibo Sisoho, and opposition leader Usainu Dabo, and his entire executive among men. Gambians were united that they wanted Yaya Gambia out. The international community stood by the people of the Gambia as we determined our fate. Opinion among Gambians within the country and diaspora were however divided. The constitution has been amended so that a simple majority of first past the goal is all that was necessary to win elections. The main opposition parties in their own individual tickets would not win. They had failed to, uh, to form a broad-based coalition to present a single candidate due to disagreement over leadership. In such a situation, many thought that going to an election would only give the incumbent a legitimate fifth term in office, a prospect many fears. The National Endowment for Democracy, NED, 
which has been supporting our work on FGM and the effective participation of women in leadership and decision making, had invited me to the US early 2016 to present our work on women's rights. While there, NEP arranged for me to meet Gambians in the US, and a panel discussion was organized to discuss the situation in the Gambia. With me in the panel was Pastor Mbajau and three others. During that discussion, I upheld the need for challenging Yaya Jame in the polls and not to boycott the election. In that debate, I remarked as follows. Change is the only constant in life. The time for change has come. This is the time of great turning, and the people of the Gambia must turn with it or miss the opportunity to create a better Gambia. For ourselves, our children, and future generations, what we can effect this change only by coming together. That was very important because we are in this very serious crisis at that time. And I thought this could help to spur and bring the feeling and inspire others to come together. That seemed to have swayed opinions towards the possibility of removing the incumbent through the ballot box. It became my campaign slogan as independent presidential candidate, Team Isotu, and was adopted by independent coalition 2016 that brought President Barrow to power. We are stronger together. Coalition 2016 was a winning strategy. After 22 years of fragmented opposition and brutal dictatorship, Gambians wanted change and demanded from politicians to, to put aside their differences over leadership. This was resolved through a primary conducted among all presidential contenders out of which Adam <coughs> Abano emerged the leader. Gambians within the country and the diaspora applauded the outcome and rallied behind our coalition flag bearer, His Excellency President Adam Abano. The, uh, the result of the December 2016 election was a resounding victory for the coalition, for Gambians, and a time of democracy over dictatorship. The international community was quick to support the change in the Gambia, a support which was both needed and timely. For as it subsequently emerged, it is one thing to beat a dictator in an election, and an entirely different thing to remove him from power. After an initial acceptance of defeat, he quickly uh, retracted and confessed a bold pass. The country once again stood on the verge of an abyss. A critical impasse ensued that demanded tact and adroitness, as was demonstrated by the leadership of the coalition <coughs> with the spokesperson, Mr. Halifa Salah. Faced with the overwhelming will of Gambians at the election, which was backed by the combined support of the UN, African Union and ECOWAS, Yaya Jame finally left the Gambia. The sub-regional body, ECOWAS, under Ellen Salif Johnson, herself now a proud recipient of the 27 Mo Ibrahim Award, 17 Mo Ibrahim Award, backed by the AU and UN, played a key role in the resolution of the impasse. The government and people of Senegal and the Gambia under President Macky Sall and Adama Barrow enjoy a mutual and special relationship, playing pivotal roles in the affairs of each country. The geographic and demographic imperatives of Senegambia and its people demand nothing less. The event in the Gambia showcased the alternative path from dictatorship to democracy through the ballot box. The role played in that process played by our neighbor Senegal under the leadership of President Macky Sall and the success of sub-regional ECOWAS in solving crisis in Africa to African agencies. What are the lessons? The lessons to be learned in effecting change is to recognize the will of the people. The collective is invincible and can determine the path a country can take. Going to the negotiation table and discussing matters is very important and allowing various views to come together and reach consensus is sure way to success. Working with various partners to support the process and drawing from best practice is key. Communication, communication, facilitating your numbers using the media and reporting 
and everybody being vigilant to know to own the process is a very key lesson if we want to take and enter in dictator. The Gambia has done it in a non-violent way. We were able to do it because of the collective. The collective is invincible when you are together. I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to address you today in this very important IBS annual lecture. Thank you very much. story and it certainly was. I've had the, the pleasure and privilege to spend some of this week with ISA2 and to, to explore further some of the, the machinations and tactics that went behind this extraordinary transition from dictatorship to democracy <coughs> and also how it was that a particular what one might call a feminist style of leadership was so important in that and I hope in question she can tell us a little bit more about her thoughts and her experiences in those areas. But I want to do that by throwing it open to, to all of you and indeed to our online audience, because I'm sure you've got questions and comments about the story itself and about its, its wider implications for the broader challenges of, of democracy and justice that so many of us are facing in the world, whichever countries we're in, living in, working in, and so on. So, um, over to you for questions. I think we've got a roving mic somewhere with Carol. Yep, and another one here. So if you'd like to raise your hand and just briefly say who you are, and we'll probably take a group of questions and then turn to Dr. Ture to answer them and take some more. So would anyone like to begin? I think I saw one, even about these sides. Um, what about this gentleman at the front to begin with? <laughs> Thank you, Excellency. Uh, my question is, how do we stop the military from gaining political recognition from regional groupings, uh, whereby at times we have opposition leaders raising claims to have been rigged, uh, they are ignored, uh, say for at least the Gambia, I think is the first uh, country as an opposition uh, to clamor for uh, democracy and uh, recognition from the regional groupings, and they were had. I'm Tony Chiafa from Zimbabwe. And then I think we had another on this side in the middle here. As a lady with the long hair in the middle, so it's very difficult spotting everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so many of them. That's good. Thank you from my side as well. I'm Stella. Um, I'm from Germany, but I have a very close friend. Um, being a t school teacher in Sukuta in Gambia. And she asked me to pose two questions. Um, <laughs> first of all, she would like to know whether you have any particular plans of um, encouraging women becoming political leaders in the Gambia, and if so, how would you like to do that? Not counting those women that are, and I quote, um, used as tools by their husbands in electoral campaigns. Um, the second question is with regard to FGM and early marriage. Um, I think it's a great development that it has been formally banned, but we all know that it's still practice. So, so how would you? What are your plans of um, combating this? Thank you. Excellent. And now let's take one from this side of the room. I'm sure, I saw some hands here. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hello. My name is Hawa. I'm from Nigeria. I'm just one. I watched the Truth and Reconciliation hearings in August. Um, yeah, Yahya Jami had, you know, and I'm wondering how the process of this um, current government led by Adam Barrow is going to um, reconcile the atrocities that are being committed and how to, like, make sure that these things don't happen again in the Gambia. Well, that's, that's quite a good yes. start. Yes. Have you, have you yes, maybe to start with that. Thank you. I think that's a very good question. Uh, the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission is about putting a platform that will create the opportunity 
for people to come out and tell their stories. First, it serves as a platform of healing and where the truth is also brought, to, where it brought out, allowing people to come. And it, uh, the reason why we are calling everybody a witness, if you look at the Truth and Reconciliation platform, everybody, whether the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator and the victims are all called witnesses. Because it's a very important tool to address the serious and gross human rights abuses and the violations that have taken place in the Gambia. You talk the truth, you reconcile, and you have seen in the process the way it is going on, where the perpetrators will acknowledge and own what they have done and then request for forgiveness. And then it clears the air for the doubts that have been going on, whether this is what the one who reported me to be detained, or whether it, is, it was Y or Z. So that also is a very big opening for all of us in that. And then reparation. Where there is need to give reparation, it will be done. Uh, um, it will be done. At the same time also, there will be justice, because life is life. There are certain atrocities that cannot be left to go free. There is no doubt about that. But in a democracy, it is not Adam Abaro or myself or any minister who can do that. It is the formal institutions that are in place, because those are the pillars of democracy, that the rule of law is a rules based. Let it prevail, let it go, and then those that deserve to be, you know, that are justiciable, will have to be done. And those that are also out there talking and expressing, creates the opportunity for us to know and clear the doubts and all. For example, I had a very uh, bad feeling towards a person I thought was also part of the team that was informing on us. Now, through the revelations that are going on, as I watch this thing, I realized he was not. I realized he was even a victim, and I realized he played a key role in ensuring that we were not even married, we were not killed in the prison. So these are all things that are coming, and these are lessons that we have to learn. So this is a very innovative approach, although it has happened in Sierra Leone, it has happened in Rwanda. But the lessons learned from all those places, the Gambia is bringing in some cultural touch to it, where people come together to talk face to face and then try to heal and make sure that we go beyond what it was. But definitely there are injustice uh, on certain matters. And no interference from the state because uh, Trying to say that we're going to play justice without taking the due process is also undermining democracy. So His Excellency President Barrow is very careful about what is going on and of course working with human rights activists. We are always reminding each other that let's put the rule of law, let us put the due diligence and procedures and that is in place. The next one is um, FGM and early marriage. Uh, yes. We have gone very far with FGM and early marriage and harmful traditional practices in general. One, we have created formal equality where the state has committed itself, itself by signing all the conventions that protect the right of the child, the CRC, you have the CEDO, you have all other conventions that protect all these rights, and we've done quite a lot of advocacy. And here I want to really underscore the amount of work that Gampo Trap did and other women's rights organizations, including institutions, have support from the UN, UNICEF, UNFPA, and many other institutions that have come. The government itself committing itself, and there's a lot of advocacy. Now, CSOs have done a lot of grassroots activism in that process. And we've created the momentum, we've built the momentum, we've, uh, we've built the awareness and the consciousness. And you have seen that communities are leaving, are, are dropping the practice. Well, it's a country, we cannot claim to be 100% covering the whole country, but we have done almost 80% of the country. And now, the work that is going on now is all about reaching out to the remaining parts of the country. And very soon you will hear a sixth dropping of the knife at the North Bank region, low, uh, where uh, that was where we stopped. And Gampo Sharp with other organizations have been working with. We've been supported by Safety Children, we've been supported by UNFPA, by UNICEF, and all other, uh, uh, the Inter-Africa Committee, and other donors who have supported the Feminist Review Trust, have been very supportive of the circumcisers, who are the custodians of the practice. We give them alternatives, we train them economically for them to change their the practice and become change makers within their communities. And many, many others who I may not have the time to call, but Ned was also one of them. You had a lot of donors that were there, and I want to say that we are moving gradually. 
I am I can safely say that the practice is ending with the generation or with our generation that have been engaged with it because the young people have taken over the advocacy. They are working and there are networks going on and I think and believe that those young people may not circumcise their children. I was among those who was lucky not to circumcise my three daughters. We went into the advocacy using ourselves as role models. Of course the practice was still going on, but it's about awareness, consciousness raising, sensitization, and that when it sinks, the laws are there as a matter of human rights to protect the children and also those who are going to disobey the, the, the rule of law. But we are taking uh, the right trajectory. And the president, when he came, strengthened that. He said <coughs> zero tolerance to female genital mutilation and early marriage. The political will is there. So what is left is to reach out to our people because it's our practice, it's our ignorance, and bringing in the evidence to make the case for people to shape their minds and make decisions to protect their children. So we are going in the right uh, direction. How do we... Um, See, they are, um, stop the military from taking political positions. Is that, that was the question. Recognition. Yeah. Recognition. Yeah. You see, when institutions are not right, anything could happen. So I am underscoring the importance of institutions getting it right and making sure that they follow their remits and follow the due diligence and procedures so that the interferences and some of the mutations that do occur in institutions is the reason why they take advantage of it and then turn it into something else. And here I want to just explain <coughs> what happens. Uh, when the former dictator came, he was a soldier. A soldier is always a soldier. When he came, he turned, he metamorphosed to a, a so-called uh, democratically elected uh, uh, president. And when he came, he actually did not look at the security outfit because the security is not only about the military. The security have the police, you have the uh, immigration, you have the navy, you have all other apparatus there. But he took his own men and brought them on a civilian space where the law and order was to be the responsibility of the police. He brought them there and removed the police and sometimes the police were even abused. I have seen in my the, um, uh, experience along the road when we are going to communities you have the immigration you have the police you have the military the military the security the, the immigration and the police no we don't care about them because <laughs> the most important people at that time were the <coughs> soldiers and they dare not even tell you please stop let me check and that was their responsibility it is the military who takes over so bring them bringing them in a space that is what that is not their ground has also created that mutation. And as a result, you have seen a lot of killing. A lot of the killings, all of the arrests, and all these things that happened were done by the military. Of course, you have few of the police who are also brought in to engage. So it's a question of getting it right, putting the right things, and following the procedures, and reminding institutions of their responsibility, which is all about what the Garda is trying to do, to get our institution right, to build the capacities, and to make capacities, and to make people to take responsibility in a way that we respect fundamental freedoms, that we recognize the limits that each institution has. But of course, where the intersections come together, they have to sit down and discuss about it. We hope that under the Third Republic, the way we are building and nurturing the pillars of democracy, there is the security sector reform that is going on right now, and is taking on the right direction. We hope that all these things will be addressed, and the bar will be raised. Because you need to have people who are well educated, who are well trained, and or who are well inducted into their responsibilities for them to know that this is not where well. I will not be used to abuse the civilians. My duty, because the soldiers have their responsibility of protecting the territorial dignity and integrity of the nation, while the police is about law and order. The prison police, police officer, officer is about the rights of the prisoner and serving the, uh, the prison. The immigration is about entry of goods and services. If everything is clear and they all know, they will all know where their boundaries are. But if you bring people who are being trained to shoot and kill into a place where civilians will always tell you, it's my right to do this, they will shoot you. So that what is going on now, all the confessions you are seeing in the TRRC, which I want to applaud for the fact that they are taking up courage to come. It's very key and fundamental in trying to create that reconciliation. 
Because where it, if you sell the truth, it will free, it will free your heart, it will free your mind. But we are traumatized by the experience that we have seen. So the culturally relevant strategies we are applying in the TRRC, and also using other ways of trying to get people to understand this the way that we are watching. The dynamics are flowing. It's not over yet, but I think it's towards the right direction. Great. So let's take another round of questions. Um, so Carlos at the front. Thank you very much for a truly inspiring presentation. My name is Carlos Fortin, and I'm an uh, research <coughs> associate at the Institute of National Chile, which is at the moment undergoing a constitutional crisis. The constitutional team is being rewritten. Uh, and a major debate at the moment is about quotas for women mm -hmm. in the constitutional convention and in parliament. Um, and the argument against it, I, I don't buy this, but I will present it. It's first of all, that it is un uh, undemocratic, because uh, it would be a situation in which a woman would be elected, not because he, she got a uh, vote, but because she was a woman. But secondly, more seriously, there's tokenism. That simply by putting women there doesn't change necessarily the fundamentals of uh, discrimination and inclusion of women. Where do you stand on that? Really, thank really you. Good question. Should we take a few more? A few got notes there. So that's up to you here at the front. Um, thank you very much, um, Herr Excellency. I wanted to thank you for the work that you've been doing with FGM because uh, I used to work in the sector as well in the Gambia, and uh, I'm aware that the, it, it got outlawed in 2016. Uh, because of the work that Gang Culture had been, had been doing for decades, among other things. Um, so I, I used to represent the Spanish Red Cross in the Gambia um, until last year, and I wanted to ask you about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and LGBTQ victims, because right now uh, same-sex relationships are still criminalized in your country, so those victims that were prosecuted, um, that were taken by the National Intelligence Agency from uh, JAMES National yeah, Intelligence Agency will not be able to come out and state that the harm that they were done if right now in this country this is still a crime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take one more. So go to the gentleman at the back here. Hi, um, good evening, Your Excellency. Um, thank you very much for saying your experiences with us. Um, my question is quite related to the previous question there. And it was, you've been a lifelong activist on gender and human rights. And my question is, where do you stand, or where does the government stand now, on the rights of sexual minorities, like LGBTI, uh, TQI? Um, so, um, my name is Marlene, I'm studying international relations and right now I'm writing an essay based on a statement, not my statement, and I would like you to um, tell you what that statement is and what you think about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is research, okay? <laughs> so, I think it's here. So it says, um, the structures of the present international system limit the capacity of African nations to achieve self-determination and full sovereignty. The structures of? Of the international system. Mm -hmm. They limit the capacity of African nations to achieve self-determination and full sovereignty. And I just wanted to know what you think about that. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I will go to them. I can learn from one discussion. They are very good. The international system, LGBTQ, and quotas for women. That's really yes. for the biggest use. I want to start with the last one the statement of the structure. The structures um, for international systems, international systems within African uh, government from self determination and development. If I get it right. Well, that's a statement that may be fairly said, 
because uh, when development is participatory and people own it, the, those comments would not come. Wherever that comment may come, we have to contextualize it. So picking it up out of a whole lot of uh, issues and bringing it out like that may not be fair. Maybe circumstances have led this, uh, this statement to come out. And uh, the world is a global village. We have to work and interact with each other, but also the agency of institutions, individuals, governments, and institutions have to be within the framework of that partnership and relationship. We cannot do without each other because we need each other. You might have comparative advantage on this, or you might have an issue in which you don't have the capacity. You need the international agencies to come in. The international agencies cannot be relevant also when the issues are not there for them to address. So all I want to say is that it depends on the context specificity, the issues that are being addressed, but we need each other. And I think uh, this is what I want to respond on that issue. Now you come to the whole issue of the LGBTQ. And uh, it was well articulated when it says during the Gamma regime, nobody was speaking about, and then the, the uh, what happened during the Gamma regime is beyond explanation. I was right in the center and the heart of the dynamics. And when these things occurred, Jame would use anything to create issues of, uh, to distract the people. LGBTQ was not an issue in the Jame regime. That's what I want to say as an activist. He was using it to, to distract because it's about rights. The rights are indivisible. We will have rights to whatever they choose to be. But he decided to bring that when other countries were prosecuting, putting in laws that were against it, and he brought it there. Remember, we are emerging from a, from a context where nobody was making the decision. It was by directives. He was the alpha and omega of everything that was being done. So some of the things that are framed around contentious issues that he engaged with were a way of distracting himself from the reality on the ground. So that the debates and the contestation and the issues that were being dealt with. It, it, at one point in time, he was saying, we are lesbians. That contract was all lesbians, we are, uh, we are not married, we have divorced our husbands, we have done everything, and he was telling people that, when you cut them, kill them. It was not meant for everybody, it was meant for a particular set of human rights activists. You see, you have to understand the dynamics within the political context, and how this was used, and how sometimes, the security forces themselves were engaged in certain nefarious acts that would create the problem so that it could create a pathway for people of their own choice. We have, in many ways, been trying to get in touch. We have worked together. I, we, we don't, that, that, that issue does not come. It's not an issue. It's not an issue. We recognize that their rights are indivisible. The country was at a difficult moment. The country was very busy looking at how to pave its way out of the atrocities that this man was doing. And he was trying to push the debate on, that, uh, on, on the issue of LGBTQ and other issues that, that were not even on our development plan at that time. I want to make that very clear because I was there in the 22 years. I didn't go out. I was moving in and out. And we were dealing with issues of rights across the spectrum. The HIV AIDS issue you have had. When he said HIV AIDS could, is going to be, can be cured, we had a meeting with the UN resident and he gave her personal non grata for saying that it is not cured. We, don't, we have not found anything that, but we are going to do work that will uh, raise the awareness of people and then we are taken out. So the issue of the LGBTQ that is there, it was not an issue at that time and it was in the context of the dictatorship where the civil space was shrunken, people had no voice, and he comes up with any idea. The witchcraft issue, now you all know. If you listen to the TRRC, what is happening? Everybody was a witch. And people were brought in. Those arrived from Mecca the following week, they were brought to the platform to come and talk about, to, to tell them that to come and confess. And many women and men were brought in there. You have all other things. They would come to our office and say, we hear that this is where the meeting takes place with the LGBT. We said we are dealing with people. So it was not an issue. I want to make that very clear. It was brought out because he wanted to turn the tide against his, against his governor, governance, and we, we refused to listen to. 
So that's, that's, that's an aspect that I want to The government is the one. You see, currently, the Ganga has emerged from a very difficult situation. We are now trying to nurture a fledgling democracy. And the pillars and tools of democracy is what Gambia is focusing on. And when you talk about human rights and fundamental freedoms, when you talk about gender equality and women's empowerment, and you talk about all the other gamuts of rights of uh, vulnerable and disability and all these things, are all rights that people... But we are setting the pillars of democracy. The constitution, the first draft of the constitution is just out. It has not captured everything. We are looking at it, looking at what are some of the things in the area of human rights that are going to be within the entrenched laws. Women's rights is not completely addressed. Youths have been given 10%. Women, even the 30% is not yet there. We have other things. But all the things that the, uh, the participatory process that took place overwhelmed the drafters, and they just threw out the first um, draft. So the issues that are coming, that are being pushed and so on, are things that, we, that are going to be looked at. So currently, it is not an issue for the Gambia. And it is not a threat to anybody because it's about rights and it's about personal, this is personal to you. Whose business is it to question your orientation or your sexuality? Who is, who is it? So sometimes the way we frame issues and how we touch on development matters depends on the level of governance and the institutions that are there. The Gambia is coming from a very fledgling situation and we are now trying to set the pillar for democracy. Mm -hmm. was, uh, me the media was completely outlawed. We are now trying to bring back a media that is vibrant, that will be expect the freedom of expression and liberties, uh, issues that are going to come up. You have different, you have the Human Rights Commission coming up. You have other things. As we move on and as we progress in consolidating the democracy, in preparing this thing for the 2021 elections, and so many other things, we are moving and focusing on that. So these are things that will emerge maybe later, but currently it's not an issue. Okay. That's great. And so this question about quotas for women's leadership, and yes. what, what, what your view is on the decision that Chile has taken for the moment, that yes. this is tokenistic. Yes, what is happening right now is that I want to say, tell you that uh, we came a long way. It's not easy. Uh, the Gambia is a highly patriarchal society, and the issue of power is highly male-dominated. And when it comes to politics, we have gone a long way. 58% of the uh, national voters are women. They have done a lot of work in politics by bringing in men in positions, showing you the democratic nature of women, and also play on their vulnerabilities. But it's no longer going to be like that. Here I am, I came out. I brought in a feminist touch. There are other women who are also coming out in other elective positions. In 2015, or was it 2010 or 2013, in the local government elections, with our advocacy on women in leadership positions, we had 15, uh, 20 women who came out, and 15 were elected in the local government positions. That's the big game. We are also dealing with perceptions. The perceptions, even whereas we as educated women are doing all the advocacy and reaching out, we also have to change the mindset of women and men. Because the status quo is women cannot be leaders, it's men. But that is changing now. The status quo is, uh, well, we have to, women have to follow the voices of their husbands in where they cast their votes. It's no longer the same. Now, women are looking at, we are building the constituency, we are strengthening the constituency. The high illiteracy rate of women is improving. We are doing a lot of grassroots activism in uh, women's organizations and also institutions are coming up. And let's watch and see how these dynamics go on. At the moment, maybe the question you want to ask, will you, uh, are you going to uh, stand for election in 2021? I am not. I am not standing for 2021 because, you know, when you think about the feminist perspective, the Gambia is coming from a very difficult situation. A situation that if it was not properly managed, we would not have been able to effect this change in a non-violent way. Because the systems were gone. It was a pariah state. We had lost hope. Nobody was there. Institutions has, have failed. And coming with this innovative approach, building on the, coll the collective, <coughs> bringing in people to come together to make sure that we effect this change in a non-violent way was a big, big plus for, the for African democracy. 
that we could it cannot deteriorate to a conflict, neither degenerate us. So this is good example and we have to nurture it. Now we all agreed to effect the change and through a democratic principle where we had the convention, His Excellency President Adam Abaro had come and we all centered around it. And I am part of the center of that core. I saw his leadership quality, his leadership style, and how he managed to respond to all the political parties to form up this coalition to save the country. Now it is not about power for me. It is about the interests of the Gambia, the people of the Gambia, and strengthening the institutions, putting in place the right procedures, principles, and laws in place, and nurture the democracy that we are uh, that to give Africa a different story. We can do it. So women, as a woman who have all the credentials it takes to be, uh, with all modesty, but the will of the people is somebody is chosen, somebody is giving a lead, and we are all part of it. I want to respect that and ensure that we do it right. So I am not interested in any political position at the moment in terms of power. We want to allow building the nation, building the gains that we have made to make the Gambia move. And I feel I have a big role to play for the fact that we have the capacity. We are trying to bring in more people. We want to galvanize that and protect the chain. It is about the chain for us, for our children in the future. Power will always be there, and the contestation will always be there, but we want to get it right. And that is how much women have brought in protecting the Gambia and saving the country with the young people to move this country forward. It's not all the time about power, because it has been done almost 22 times. Political parties have been not been giving each other. It was all contestation over leadership, and uh, that has strengthened and entrenched the dictator. And having been there, from a development perspective, ideas is always giving you that development critical consciousness. Uh, I said, this is not the time. So it is time to protect the chain. It is time to concede power. It is time to listen to the will of the people. And Adam Abaro is the choice of the people for the moment. But we're going to make sure that we follow the due diligence. We follow the pillars of democracy to move the country forward. We, we, don't, and, 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 uh, we don't foresee any other dictatorship coming up. That's what we are fighting for. So I think we will draw to a close. We've, we've heard a great deal from Isatu, from Her Excellency, and I think it's time for us to move downstairs where we have a, a drinks reception in, actually it's in the convening space, I think, am I right? Or, upper or in the upper common room downstairs where we can, I think, give our speaker a well-earned rest, but also an opportunity to speak informally with you. So let me, one more time, thank Dr. Touré, academic, activist, politician, who's managed to weave these different aspects of an extraordinary career together to effect a really transformational change for her country and to provide an example to the world that I think we can all learn from. So join me in thanking one more time.